The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, hello. Welcome back. It is Brian and Mr. Betcher and Mr. Lynn for Breaking Out Security. Hello. Oh, he's, he's, oh, no. he's giving me the silent oh. No, there we go. It's very, I'm very, I'm very confused. It's not dark outside and we're podcasting. Oh. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's my nap time. <laughs> <laughs> nap time? Oh, he's a little tie tie. He's a uh, He's getting caffeinated. Oh, my. So that's cool. Um, yeah, welcome back, everybody. This is, of course, Breaking Down Security. And, uh, you know, we are doing another interview, which is great because, uh, you know, sometimes it, it's, it's, it's your drought or your flooding. You either don't have any interviews or it's like interviews out the yang. So um, I'm just always of- happy we do- when we don't have to talk about news. Right, right. You know, and, the, and there's great podcasts out there that do that. And I love are the there? security. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> It's going to be a few weeks before they hear this. So, you know, uh, Jerry and Andy, love y'all. Um, they make fun it. of me enough as it is. I can Aww. I can poke fun at them sometimes. That's true. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we've had, you know, a lot of great discussions and uh, we're going to have a lot more in the, in the coming years. And uh, this week, uh, uh, we're going to be talking to Connor Sherman. A uh, little background here. Uh, you know, I was I was doing a team uh, team thing uh, at my organization. We do a lot of things to try to, you know, maintain our mental health. Uh, you know, we get goodie bags and goodie boxes. And uh, we had Dr. Dan Diamond come in and talk about, you know, trying to do team building. We did some team building and such. And one of the quotes that he gave us, uh, which actually hit home for me, it was kind of interesting, uh, was one from uh, a- uh, author Viktor Frankl. Uh, and it said, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. And that's from uh, Man's Search for Meaning, which uh, we're not going to be talking about what that book's contents was about, which it, I've heard it's, a, it's an excellent book. Um, but when I heard this, the first thing I thought of from a security Uh, point of view was incident response and you know this is exactly where we come from it's like there's stimulus that requires us to make a response and there's a there's a bit of a a bit of a space there where it's like oh do we want to you know declare a response you know do we want to do what do we declare our response and then you know we grow and we learn from that and we continue on and we get better so uh we've had connor we've been trying to get connor on for a while um you know he does incident response, and the last time we tried to get him on, he had an incident response. So, like <laughs> with Miss Berlin, customers come first, family comes first, podcast comes second. So, uh, we were very happy to have Connor join us this week uh, on uh, Breaking Down Security. We're going to talk a little bit about incident response. So, uh, welcome Connor to the show, and uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got to where you are today. Guys, thank you so much for having me. As you mentioned, it has just been a long time coming. It's just like we try and get all schedules, get on the um, get on the calendar, and then of course the adversary has a vote as well. Mm. So I really appreciate the the effort and the diligence to like finally make this happen. So thank you for having me today. Cool, awesome. Yeah, so, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you came from, how you got to be where you're at today. Thank you. Yeah. So my career has been focused in building and running security programs for financial services organizations or high-tech firms, and then in the middle consulting to both of those. Um, I think you have to have been dropped as a child to really dig and say, I want instant responses in my life. You know, like I really wanted to be a blue teamer here because it is just, there's so much all the time. But with that, we get really exciting problem sets and challenges. I like to tell people it's kind of like solving a Rubik's cube that fights back. You know, it is exciting, good work. So I've been in this place for a while now. And, you know, so my journey started when I was, really getting into financial services in the Boston area. I seemed to kind of call that home and did that was there for about five years, was in New York for five years, temporarily now in North Carolina, but slowly making my way back over to Boston. Um, And through this journey, just have really fallen in love with helping people and organizations bring clarity and calm to the time when it is most stressful. Right, when you've got an adversary knocking at your door, if you are not prepared for that, that can really put you back on your heels. 
So building out strong instant response programs and making sure that there is this idea that all the way from the engineer up to the executive, that there is planning, that there is run books, that there is preparation that is done for the inevitable, right? And then when that happens, I really love that quote you said, Brian, from Viktor Frankl, and being deliberate in that space, right? So in that moment of instant response. So... Yeah, you asked me how I got started. Um, I think one of the things that my dad used to say growing up was this phrase that he learned from his dad because uh, there I was because my dad's English and my grandfather was in the English um, armed forces, and they had this phrase: "Prior preparation and planning prevents poor performance." And there was well, coming from the military, there's a few other pieces. There's in there more that, words in there, right? <laughs> <laughs> there are. I'm just not going to edit those out for the audience, uh, but. That phrase really kind of tells you what you need to know about instant response is that if you can have this prior preparation and planning and training and all of that, we can prevent an event of poor performance, which is responding. So I came to security like many other people, um, teenager, angsty teenager discovers Linux. And I was like, okay, this is fun. Okay, I know what I'm going to do for the rest of my career now. And just diving into that. But what kind of drew my beyond the intellect, but what drew me to it was a sense of confusion people had around technology. They thought that those was an area of abuse and people didn't know how to respond or protect themselves in that space. And so that other kind of human element to me is what's kind of kept me going for these last 10, 15 years is really just connecting at that level. So I got started in my career, got going. And then when I was early days on support desk, I discovered a new variant of malware um, and it wasn't like that particularly um, sophisticated. Um, we ended up calling it, and there's some SANS article out there and they gave me credit for those guys the storm, over in Storm Center, you know, eons ago. And because I submitted it and I was all proud as like a 22 year old, like, hey, I found something really neat and cool. But effectively we call, I called this the, um, what I call it, the Greenpeace malware, as it was an attack against Greenpeace because they're always saving the planet, which is, you know, wonderful and noble. And what the adversary had done is they sent a botched command to the, for, to the malware. The malware had moved itself, moved the executable to the print spooler a driver and for a print server. So thus, all the printers in the office tried to print the executable code and it just ran out of paper everywhere. So every printer across the space just ran out of print paper because it just printed garbage. And hence the, uh, the sarcastic nickname I gave it when I was 22. So that when I kind of got that going, I'm <laughs> like, yeah, this is fun. Like this is where you need to be is dealing with this stuff. And then since there, um, adventures have ensued. Very nice, okay. Uh, Ms. Berlin, this is uh, this was uh, suggested by you, so I would love for you to go ahead and ask the first question. Oh, I was gonna say, yeah, Connor, Connor and I met what like six years ago, maybe. Sounds about right. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, he was uh, when I was doing uh, other less cool sim work. <laughs> <laughs> you were helping me, company. so I, yeah. I appreciate yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> Connor was actually one of my uh, only engaged customers. <laughs> Oh, wow. yeah. <laughs> and that's always that's always uh you know a bright spot in, in people's uh work day when you can actually work with somebody that cares about security um so yeah i mean where where should we even start you know we want to talk about different ir stories and um do you have like any any favorite like i think oh uh, yeah things? so let's let's talk about a good favorite story of mine yeah. um you talk about the narrative of the story, the punchline is focus on the basics, like do the basics well and life mm -hmm. will be better for you, right? Yep. Um, I saw once there was a presentation at some security conference and it gave us two photos and it was a Mario Kart where you had to jump over one thing, or like, sorry, a Mario Brothers and he jumped over one thing and ta-da, he won and it was super easy. And the other one was like super complex and there's like daggers and danger and all this stuff. And it's like, which environment is yours for the adversary, right? Is it like super easy to just hop over one box and then they win or do they have to get through 10 or 12 different layered defenses and controls. So um, the moral of this story, children, is patch takes RDP servers off the internet and don't have default credentials. Okay, so I've already spoiled it. So I was working with, uh, back in my consulting days, had a client and they called in and they said, we have this 
dot crypto file on our corporate cert on our primary system that hosts hosts our SQL database and all of our stores, they phone in and they get their updates from this particular server. So A, why do you only have one server supporting like your entire technology infrastructure for the love of God? Like that was a bad idea. Um, so we get in there and what we found is that the what brought their attention to it was that the uh, SQL service kept stopping and they would go in there, they'd start it again. And the next day it would stop and they'd be like, what's going on? Um, and then they found this um, crypto file on there and then they panicked and they called in some response and we got in there and we found it was at the end of the day, we found that they fin six, either fin six or fin seven was what it was pointing to as an organized crime unit had just gone through and was really focused on stealing um, financial data. That's their MO. That's what they're after. And so we got into the environment and we realized step one, there was no logging anywhere. So there was no visibility, anything. So we're dropping the network sensors, we're turning on logging for the first time. The only policy that existed, the adversary had put in there to turn off any logging that might be to there. Uh, so again, another indicator. And so we got in there, we took a look at the, um, the environment and we could see that there was an open PowerShell running in memory. It was beaconing back, it was Cobalt Strike and they were phoning home to a couple IP addresses. So now thankfully, for those who are using Cobalt Strike as an adversarial technique, they tend, like Fin6, Fin7, they tend to not rotate their infrastructure a lot. They tend to have a couple IP address they phone home to. So once we found that, it was like, okay, great. What else is connected out to this space? And we found our kind of initial round of compromised hosts. From there, you start to look at your identities. Okay, who's been logging into these things? Who's been making changes? Lo and behold, this particular thing came in either one of two ways. Because there was no login, we don't have a definitive joke. Well, they had RDP servers that people were remoting into in their environment. So that was their remote access strategy it was just an open RDP server. Um, and it didn't have any additional protections and it also had administrator accounts. You could just log in. So if you guess the password, which was easy to guess, you could get in with an admin box. Now, of course, this happens to be joined to a domain. And so when you got administrator, they actually gave the administrator account domain admin privileges. So that was one vector. So that's, again, a basic, basic, basic thing to get control ac access control underway, but they didn't. So the adversary got in. And then in addition to that, we also saw that there was an IT, a uh, local IT guy on the other side of the country who had compromised credentials. And we saw the adversary had taken his credentials and he had domain admin. So we know the adversary had domain admin in a few different places. So this was just one where we're walking through the client and we're like, okay, you have no logging. You have no sophisticated endpoints protections. They had something, but it obviously wasn't doing the job. Then they didn't have any network layer visibility. So as far as their infrastructure, they're just a sitting duck. And of course it hits, it hit at a time and it's terrible when these things happen and you just wanna make sure that when it does happen and you've done that prior preparation and planning, that you have the visibility and the capability to do something about it. And this was a fun, engaging, exciting one because I got to be, me and my team got to swoop in there and do the forensics and do the IR, do all the excitement. But the other side is you're going back to the customer and you're like, a little bit of uh, investment up front would have saved you a very big instant response bill that you have, not just with us, but then also your cyber insurance companies now involved, you've got customers who are now involved, so and so, so forth. So. That was a, a good recent example of just like, even now people overlook the basics. Um, and it's not to knock people. It's just a lot, like, you gotta line yourself up with your incentives, right? So sometimes you have IT teams who are just crushed, right? They're just focused on keeping the lights on, keeping that one SQL server running or whatever it is. And we forget that, you know, there are adversaries out where they may forget that there are adversaries out there who also want this data that it's not just IT who wants to keep it running, like the adversary wants it as well. So you are defending against an active somebody on the other side of that. So that was a, that was a fun recent example. Cool, okay. Um, so you mentioned basic hygiene. Uh, what, uh, do you have any kind of specific list of things oh, yeah. that we, you suggest? <laughs> uh, or, you know, I mean, we, we've talked about the CIS top 20 security controls as a, as a, uh, you know, basic hygiene method, you know, knowing what's in your environment, what your software loadout is. Um, you mentioned they had not very good EDR protection. Um, what are, I mean, nicely. 
these are <laughs> these are these some of the you know we keep talking about quick wins but i think a lot of the basic hygiene stuff can never be a quick win because of the amount of time and investment involved so hmm. um what are what are some what are some of the the basic hygiene things hmm. is it top 20 stuff or is it you know uh how, and how do you frame that conversation if you're you know the blue team going hey look doom and gloom is going to happen at some point and then your boss is like well it's not happening right now so screw it yes okay that would be the absolute worst interpretation of richard branson's screw it let's do it it's like right so if yes. you're like yeah oh, screw it we'll get to that later yeah. it's like no no no. it's like we should take action that's the moral of that phrase right we should take action to improve the environment so okay so yes a really good question what are the fundamentals where should we be focused and also so i want to break that down into two different audiences one is okay you're an executive and you don't have a security team but you have a technology responsibility right so i'm going to just talk about what you how you may frame doing good hygiene there and why that's important um and then the second is the the blue team red team so and you do have a security team but maybe you're understaffed and you're having a hard time getting the ball moving so first one i can't give enough love to cis 20 right i just keep like it's so important. I wish everyone in the security community understood this. And those in the technology community understood this. It's like, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't reinvent the wheel. Just put the wheel on the cars and move forward. Like, don't reinvent the wheel. And it's just not because CIS 20 is some magical thing. Like, it's not. Like, it has plenty of gaps. It doesn't go far enough in product security. It's not helping you with code security. It's not helping you with those layer products but it lays you a foundation for secure infrastructure, right? And if everything's built on your infrastructure, that's a really good place to start. So, um, so let's unpack that for a second. So as of July this year, CCPA went into enforcement. So if you're an executive and you have more than, I think it's 50,000 employees, excuse me, if you have more than 50,000 customers that are California resident, and there's a one of the metric around how much revenue that you make, so it doesn't take much for CCPA to be a regulation that you have to pay attention to. Part of what CCPA and GDPR mandate, not suggest, not maybe someday, but they mandate is that you have a, what's called a reasonable security program. Now, what they are saying is that for the size of organization you are, for the sensitivity of the data that you're holding, you should have reasonable security controls in place. Now, a lot of people say that's open to interpretation, da, da, da. Well, well yes, it is um, kind of by design because we wanted every company is a little different. But if you don't know where to start, you can always go back. There's a really great quote out there. So Senator Kamala Harris, when she was the attorney general in California, she said that the CIS 20 is a representation of what a reasonable security program looks like. That was her phrasing, not mine. So if you want to know where to start, the California attorney general, who is in charge of enforcing this stuff when she had that office, she said CIS 20 was reasonable security. So if you needed like the answers in the back of the textbook, that was it. So I really encourage executives to say, let's start with the basics, let's get good infrastructure, let's start with the CIS 20 and implement it as effectively as possible. Don't cram it in three months, but don't take a year and a half to get it done either. Walk through it and get it embedded because there are, in addition to technology changes, there's, there are process changes and your company has a culture and that culture has to be able to absorb that change, right? People have an elasticity, cultures and companies have an elasticity. And when you introduce change, you kind of take up those elasticity points. If you take up too much, something snaps. So introduce it as quickly, but as effectively as possible. And that's for every company to decide what it is. But as an executive, remember you've got both um, the state of California can come after you if you're not performing reasonable security. There are civil lawsuits, which can go up to like $100 to $750 per record that can come after you. So we're talking like millions of dollars very quickly in like technology, excuse me, in security liability that's sitting on your table. So if you think about your company and all the risks that you're managing right now between COVID and shipping your product and engaging new customers and keeping the customers you have, you also have a handful of multi-million dollar risk sitting on the table with CCPA if you're not compliant. Now, one of the ways to greatly de-risk that is just implement the CIS 20 controls. It's not an overnight thing, but it's also not prohibitively expensive either. And so, and by the way, by doing so, you position yourself to, de to not deal with a breach because all of that cost you now just de-risked, right? Um, I think it was the 
IBM report that came out um, said that the average bre- the two 2020 data came out and it was like the average breach cost is $3.86 million was the average cost of the breach that they had investigated in their survey sample. So if you think about it, you can very quickly rack up like $10 million worth of liability that your company could be handling. And that's just a, a number out of thin air. Every company is different. But you can de-risk this really quickly by starting to implement things like basic hygiene, CIS 20, cloud configuration, so on and so forth. Right. So anyway, that's a long-winded answer. It's a really simple question. <laughs> but from an executive point of view, that's kind of like where I like to position the messaging because that can get some real buy-in there because there's real value to the company to do it that way. And you talk about like the different elasticity points, right? Which is, I, I don't think I've ever heard it put that way. And I like that um, because like different portions of the CIS 20 are going to have a different amount of points mm-hmm. and to different people too. So you may be, I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, well, I can't do asset management. It's going to take me two, two years to implement asset management. Well, but that's yeah. just like, that's one out of 20. Like you can't take two years for all 20 of these. How long is that going to take? Um, you know, you could do different pieces and parts of this to work towards that ultimate goal, you know, in a, in a shorter yeah. amount of time. And if our goal as a security community is to ensure that companies as within reason don't get breached, now we can never get to 100%, but there is a... Um, there is a sense of an asymptotic relationship between security investment and likelihood of breach. It never gets to zero, but you can continuously approach that um, and kind of drive that down. So there is this asymptotic relationship that we can work with it. So working within those com- uh, those boundaries. So our goal is to prevent, right? That's what we're really after. <laughs> but your point, Amanda, it's like, well, where can we start? That is the lowest friction, the highest fruit. Well, we can start on the detection side, at least. Let's bring visibility and observability into it. So I think it's like six of the 20 controls are actually put your logging on. Like they have different places and they want visibility in certain areas, but it's like, just turn on logging, put in a central place. At least when you get breached, you know how and where it came from and what the impact was. Um, And so you can contain that up. Uh, fun fact, out of that data breach report, I think though, and you can correct me on this one, there was like a $300,000 breach cost reduction for teams that had a good instant response plan. Like, so the teams that had an instant response program and they practiced it via tabletops, and I infer that means up to the executive level. That's kind mm-hmm. of how I run my programs. So there's the technical, the engineer to the um, executive. If you have that, like just you, that, that $3.86 million, it comes down by $300,000. It's, you know, it's not millions, but it's a good chunk of change that you don't have to spend. Um, right. So anyway, go back to your CIS 20. It's like, yeah, let's start with the detection space at least. Right. And then we can kind of move this over to the protection space um, and just kind of walk that through. Um, yeah. And I'm all, I'm all for the detection part. Yeah. I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> As I preach to the choir there. Well, we it's like, let's about, give you a bunch of log data, and do some threat hunting. We talk about having those basics down, but I, I've done, I don't know, 30 uh, different engagements with companies and and one of the first things i asked when because we needed to find scope is where's your asset list and i don't think any of them have been able to give me Hmm. uh, a decent asset list yeah they'll they'll run a active directory query real quick and uh, give me a list of systems but they've got systems in there that haven't reported in for two years Sure. Right. And, and they have systems in there, obviously, that that have never reported in uh, because they were misconfigured in some way. So just the basics, like what do you have out there isn't being done from my perspective. And um, oh. and yeah, so so there's that. And but but the, the people who do do a decent job at the basics uh, can have a lot of. Um, can have a lot of success when there is an incident, um, even if they don't have the fancy, you know, whiz bang products, right? So uh, yeah. one engagement that I was not in personally, but a colleague of mine was, said that they did have the fancy EDR, millions of dollars spent on that product. They also had antivirus. They actually had two antiviruses. Um, sometimes on the same systems and they still weren't able to figure out 
what was going on because they didn't have their logging in place, like you said. So yeah, you can get a lot of uh, a lot of success out there just doing the basics. You don't need the whiz bangs in order to get started on, okay, where did this come from, like you said? Uh, do you see that as well? Man, yes, we, we all know the answer to that question. It's like the, the, the struggle, the pain is real, the struggle is real. Um, but I would also say, here's my glimmer of hope. Like I always wanna give people a sense of hope around this is because just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, right? You know, getting up and going for a run in the morning, it's a pain when it's cold outside, but we know it's good for us, so we go and do it. Or eating our veggies, yes, we should do more of that. We all know we should be doing these things. So um, to unpack that a little bit, like one of the great things has happened. Now there's been this massive adoption of obviously SaaS, cloud services, and, and all of that. <laughs> Um, so class, so SaaS services and such. And yes, there's been its own risks that have come with that, right? Data, there's like data may not have the same controls. Identity access management has become a real thing as that's become the control plane. And we can unpack that as it relates to IR in a bit. But one of the hopeful things here is this. We've normalized inadvertently on a common infrastructure. So how you have these assets how they're registered in AWS when you spin up that EC2 instance, that is the same for every company. So the market has replied and said, great, now we can hook into that over an API, we have asset to this. So the point here is we've accidentally made our lives a little easier by shoving everything into the cloud and having it over a normalized data plane. So then you look at companies, can I drop a company on the podcast? Just, they, I have no affiliation. Can I just yeah, drop sure. a vendor? Yeah, sure, okay. sure. Cool. So there's companies like Umista and others out there. And what they do for asset management, and it's OO, and what they do is they say, great, give me an API integration in all of your stuff, pull it in, and that's how you got integrations. So now that poor IT person isn't like trying to run around with a spreadsheet, which was like the old poor man's way of doing it. Um, I mean, their software is not free and it's not cheap, but it's, it's good stuff. What they do is they'll say, well, hook into your, your Okta, your Google, your AWS, your Jamf, your whatever, uh, pull it all into one place, and you're getting closer to solving this problem, right? Like that jam, like you got to make sure the agent's still installed on all the machines. Like that work still needs to be done. But at least 80-20, you're getting most of your environment from all these different places and normalizing it. So it's hard. It's hard to get it complete. But if you kind of think about it as like, we have all these SaaS services. Is there a way that we can bring these together via an API into a normalized place? I think that will be the winning path forward from an 80-20 principle. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Just my thoughts, but you're absolutely right, right? <clears throat> so we have some we have some topics here. You you had mentioned uh, that you love everything as code. Um, <laughs> governance as code. Detection as code. How do you do governance as code? Is is governance not the same as compliance? Or um, uh, yes. what does that look like for you? Um, and it, you know, I have a follow on question depending on your answer. <laughs> oh, God, the pressure is on. I'm like, okay, how am I going to game this one out? Uh, so basically... So totally off topic. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. So that Mario Brothers thing I was talking about a second ago. Let's go back to that. Um, no, it's not fact that. So yes, compliance and governance is code are very, very similar in my mind. Um, what the point here is that when you have this normalized infrastructure like AWS, GCP, Azure, whatever cloud environment you're on, or whatever SaaS services you're using, when we try to tell people what to do via policies and documents and such, it doesn't work that well. We've known this for a long time. Like there are important legal documents to have. They are <laughs> technically, you know, the policy control is technically a control. It sits within any control framework, um, but it's just not that effective of stopping the bad thing from happening. So where appropriate, it's best to take those do's and don'ts and write them into code and get that into the right control plane. So if you're a company that's shipping code and you make your product because you're a SaaS service or you're whatever, and you make your value is realized as a company with what you put through your CI CD pipeline, well, let's put some freedom within limits there, right? Let's make sure that critical vulnerabilities, and this is not saying if they can do it overnight, you got to walk into this, but let's make sure that static code analysis, when it finds a critical vulnerability, doesn't let that code be merged into your um, production branch if it has a critical vulnerability. That statement would have lived in your vulnerability management policy. But if we can now integrate into your CICD pipeline, that's, in my mind, that's governance as code. And it's either an enforcement mechanism where it just rejects the, the, P, the PR, or it's a notification to the developer, hey, you really shouldn't do this. 
in you. And that's a company culture and risk tolerance decision to make. Mm-hmm. But then you start to get into things like, well, what if your infrastructure, what if your AWS infrastructure's infrastructure is code, right? Um, Terraform, wonderful. Well, let's put some Terraform policies to make sure that S3 bucket doesn't end up on the internet or that all your uh, snapshots have to be in an de- encrypted state. And if they're not, it doesn't even get released into um, production. You can't even merge that Terraform code. It gets spit back to the SRE. So that type of way of saying who... So I think this is really important for security teams is like, stop thinking about yourself, start thinking about the consumers of this and saying, if my SRE team is the people I'm trying to help make secure AWS environment, GCP, cloud, environment, whatever, what tool chain do they use? And how do I take my, the identification of these risks and these, these solutions that we've worked together on, put them in their day-to-day operations technically, such that it's, they're getting notified the way they want to get notified. It's in Slack or PageDuty, whatever the case is, or that merge is getting failed and there's good errors around it. Then that will work for some. And then you're going to talk to like your legal team who's dropping everything in box. It's going to look very different on how you help do the governance of code there. Hmm. So the point here is, let's find the teams who are consuming the data. Let's find the right control plane for those environments. And let's break down our aspirational statements, which are in policies, make them real and integrate them into those um, data planes. Cool. Control planes, sorry. Control planes. Cool. Yeah. I, um, I, okay. That answers my question. Uh, so well, what about the follow-up question? I, I'm like, wait for this, man. I, I do have a follow-up question, but it, it's, uh, What's it, your it's thought not on nachos? Like, no. Yeah. It's not, it's not like, aha, I got you. But um, so we, you know, we work in environments where everything is code. Uh, we have developers doing things. Uh, you know, you're talking about compliance and governance, and those are restrictions that these, you know, 10x engineers that you know want to push out all the code and make all the things. And those are restrictions that are being put on these developers. Um, how do we how do we get those developers to want to care about? You know, oh yeah, I just want to set up this S3 bucket and put a bunch of shit in it. And oh yeah, oh yeah, the re, you know the rewrite thing that's not a big deal. We'll just go ahead and put that out there. Um, okay. How do you how do you get people in a an environment yeah. to care because the code is pretty much just policy saying no 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 you can't do this mm-hmm. or you know because nobody ever says oh yeah we're going to put a policy in that allows everybody to do everything um, from a security standpoint we're locking things down, whereas the developers want to open things up. Um, so it, it, you mentioned culture. Mm. So it's definitely a cultural thing. We got we have to make people want to lock things down for the good of whether it be their job, their livelihood, the company, the customers. Um, so, so how do we motivate them to do that? Okay. So that's not a question. That's a whole episode on the podcast. <laughs> I know, right? So, okay. I know, so right? I do have a few thoughts on this um, because this is so important what you just said. So there's a, a framing of the argument and then there's the, the metric I want to highlight. Yep. So first and foremost, um, I mean, we were talking about this beforehand. Like I also run a podcast, the Confident Events podcast, and we also have Confident Events Insights where every Friday morning, um, James Chiapetta who is the actual expert about the quote is he and I talk about the news, talk about some insights that are going on in the security space to make it available to people. They can find that on YouTube if they so care. He is on a mission to transform the way AppSec and developers work together because this is really critical. So in some of his most recent um, Medium articles, um, he highlights the fact that for AppSec engineers, and this is not him giving these numbers, he's quoting um, some he's referencing some industry in, in analysis that's been done. AppSec engineers will tell you that there, 75% of them surveyed will tell you that there is a cultural divide be from them trying to help the business, the developers who are writing this code and the developers and engineers who are receiving this, right? There is just this clash, this systemic structural clash where engineers don't want to have to hear what AppSec people are saying and they're fighting for a seat at the table. And then where if you talk to developers, like, hey, what's your perspective on security? 50% of them will tell you there's a cultural divide. And like 65% of them will say that just like AppSec people don't get the pressure that I'm under. I need to ship code. Like my bonus, my paycheck is built on how many widgets I commit and how many PRs I do. And that's where I'm at. So you asked a really good question. And so I want to highlight that by saying that there is at this moment a complete cultural divide between security teams who are trying to put forth um, solutions and help the AppSec team, sorry, help the engineering team and the engineers who are on the receiving this. And I think it comes down to what you referred to, Brian, as the framing of the argument you had, which was 
Security wants to lock things down and make things safe. Engineers want to open things up and get things moving. And so the only path forward can be this idea of freedom within limits. And I totally stole that when reading one of my books for my, one of the Montessori books for my son. Like I have a new newborn or we're going through all the parenting things. And I was reading the Montessori book and they're like, freedom within limits. I'm like, this is what I've been looking for my whole career. And this is this idea that like AppSec and teams who are referred who are in charge of security, their job is to say, what are the no-go zones? When you're, when you're hitting the danger zone? Okay, if you're not in the danger zone, feel free to do what you need to do. And don't come to me for every single, security doesn't need to review every pull request. They just need to revo- review the pull requests that have risk associated with it. And we've characterized what that looks like. Or where you know we prevent that merge and that it goes back to the engineer and the engineer knows why it got the merge failed and they have to go you know update that library, fix that code syntax, whatever the case is. So I think the only way for us as a community is to help fix this problem is to stop saying no and start saying, yes, here's how. And that's got to be the fundamental shift in everything that we do. You know, that's my opinion. No, that's cool. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we, we've had other folks on and it's, it's very much, a, it seems like a cultural thing where it's like, you know, uh, either it's, we've done it this way for the last, you know, 10 years or, you know, well, yeah. five if you're a startup. Um, uh, and, you know, why do we need to change now? It's worked so far. And, you know, you talking about framing the conversation, you know, we're going back to incident response. If you can take a report like that IBM report, which I believe that's the one we have in the show notes dated uh, July 29th, 2020, talking about, you know, just doing X will save you potentially millions and millions of dollars if there's an actual, uh, you know, doing the basics is going to save you in the long run in time, effort, yep. uh, potential uh, breach. It, it, you know, those are the kinds of things and ways you can frame your conversation with senior leadership or developers and saying, look, we're going to save $70 million a year if shit hits a fan and we have an incident response. This is going to, you know, we'd rather save the 70 million on the back end or, you know, on the, on the front end versus, you know, spending, you know, a thousand dollars on the back end doing, you know, asset management or, you know, spending, you know, I don't know how much ever it is for AWS to give you your asset management, you know, through the, the, the CLI. So, so uh, yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So to that, to that point, I like to talk about incentives, right? Incentives drive human behavior. Humans make decisions based on the options available and they choose the option with the most positive incentive. So like I'd be a negative or positive, but like that strong, whatever's pulling them one way or another. Right. So to that point, I would say that you need to have that. Ex- Everyone says like executive buy-in. Okay. Let's break that down. What does that mean? Dollars. Talk about the cost of a breach. Talk about what that's going to do to the, like this, this financial rate. There's a financial impact. There's a brand impact. There's a customer churn impact. There's longevity in the marketplace. These are all things that are meaningful to the executives who are trying to build and grow this company. So that's how you start to frame that executive buying conversation. Then you turn around to the engineering team and you're like, you don't want to be the guy who or gal who committed that code that got us breached in the first place or committed that Terraform that did that data leak via that S3 bucket or that RDS instance. So I would say it's you got to come from both top and bottom. And when you're coming from think about the engineers, then we have to solve security like an engineer. And this is where like security stops becoming the office of no, but really stops to become solutions engineering for organizations. The ability for us to say, you have this problem set. I'm not gonna tell you what to do yet. I'm gonna step back, think about it, like I'm developing a product for you as my customer. Then I'm gonna step forward and say, okay, I think of the three options, we should choose one of these. What do you engineer want? What would make it light, better for your life? And have that two-way dialogue and be okay to be wrong. And But think of it almost like you're a, a customer service orientation and your engineers are your customers. I think that framing really kind of helps change the dialogue, kind of turn down the temperature a little bit and make us more successful. Very nice. Yeah. Um, I, I'd never heard of the freedom within limits uh, uh, deal with the Montessori thing. So I would, you know, was doing a little research on that. So that... Uh, you know, we talk about guardrails, so that's it's it, you know security should be guardrails and not speed bumps or, or what have you. So yeah. that that makes complete sense. Uh, uh, we've talked about that before, but it yeah, I, I can definitely see how this is. Uh, the, it's amazing how all the different things that we see in our lives uh, equate to security versus. <laughs> it really does. Think about like safety features in the car. You right. are more likely to drive faster on the autobahn 
if you know that you have a seatbelt, that you have airbags, if you have like that car can go faster and you can get more out of that car on the Autobahn if you've got the right safety features in place. If your doors are falling off and your wheels are wobbly and there's no safety features, I'm not taking that thing 100 miles an hour. I don't know. I know some I people. The... <laughs> I know some people that definitely still would. <laughs> cool. And then we know it. But insecurity, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> and I think so that's the actually... reason cars started being able to, to drive faster was not because they made the improvements in the engine. It was because they developed brakes. Because the first cars yeah. didn't have brakes, so you couldn't drive very fast. Uh, otherwise, you couldn't that. stop. I did not know that we released cars without brakes. That's yes. mind boggling. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, we want to go. How do you stop? Well, he put the pedestrians hit, in the way, and that. eventually, you know, you hit enough of them, you'll get where you want to go. The roads were so bad that you, I mean, they had so much friction, you would stop anyway, right? Uh, Just I'd, over a few I'd, seconds. I seen him when I was a kid. You stop with your feet, right? If you no, Fred no. Flintstone style. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. 100%. 100%. Yeah. That's funny. Um, uh, <laughs> very funny all right so so um detection is code miss berlin is uh you know she's a big fan of detection uh and and uh, using sim uh how can you use detection as code yeah. when you're working uh you know in, in your business it um obviously it takes code uh in in terms of you know endpoint security or sim agents or you know yes, uh, being... but... go ahead but that logic, right? It's like, <clears throat> we have spent so much of our time in our lives. Like, I, and man, I'm going to speak for you. Like, could, I can't count the amount of correlation searches that I've written in my time, right? The amount of time, it's just like, I have these disparate log sources and I need to write it and you're like, great, it works. And then there's a change. And then you go back to the beginning and you rewrite and you rewrite and it's annoying. And then a security event happens. And you're like, great, I have a search for this. Oh, wait, it no longer works. Or wait, why did I not get detected off of that? Oh, it's because someone in the UI accidentally right-clicked and disabled it or changed it from an every 15 minute interval to every 15 hour interval. And so we missed the breach window or the attack window. So that is my very frustrated way of saying <laughs> that we need a slightly better way of handling our detections. I think this, this model of, going and this is a fledgling idea like it's been around it's been around for a couple of years people kind of been talking about it. i don't think it's a mainstream thing yet i think we're going to get a little better um at it there is a toolkit that i will think of and i will double check the thing is called sigma um an open source yeah. project yep. that kind of started this kind of let's hey let's create a normalized language so basically the idea is this we have these log sources that end up in these sims uh, log aggregators or true sims um, we have the event correlation. They then are exposing the ability to manipulate logs and searches via an API. So the detection of code is really saying, instead of creating your content and leaving it in the UI where someone has to go in and click it, can we not extract that content, that search, commit it to a repository, just like we do everything else, and then via some, um, some very, my, uh, very basic like CI pipeline, push that push that content to the SIM platform over an API, but then you have a copy of your search query in your repository. You kind of treat it like a piece of code. Hey, we realize we have a false positive, also known as a bug. Cool, let's do a bug. Um, the team at Palantir did an awesome um, Medium article on this a couple of years ago, and that's what just like kind of turned my attention to it. Um, and I really liked how they were thinking about it. So. I just think this idea of having all of our content sitting in the UI space is limited, it's error prone um, versus if we can make it more modular more, and commit it via the API and have it as code, then we get more flexibility and we get more control over it. Um, and then of course, if someone screws something up, well, if every five minutes we're re-pushing and making sure that the deterministically ensuring our detections are in a steady state. And so it messes it up. Well, it just kind of reverts back to the last known good, which you have in your code, uh, code repository. So that's the basic idea. It's just to like, let's bring visibility to it. Let's treat it like an object of code. So we put those engineering practices around it. And then instead of having it in the UI, you put it in the uh, code base. That's my takeaway of it <clears throat> in a nutshell. Are you gonna go, Brian? Uh, okay. Uh, I was gonna say I'm a huge I'm a huge fan of Sigma rules. Um, the the whole concept just blew my mind first when I when I found out about it. I'm like, what you mean? There's like 
a standard way all of us can look at this because before that everything is vendor agnostic and you're rewriting the same rules if you are on this sim or this detection platform or this you're rewriting it in different language and redoing work over and over and over again and that's just an easier way to keep track of things and to just for broader implementation of stuff they're fantastic yeah i still get tripped up on the um splunk to sumo right stats count by in splunk means one thing and then in sumo it just counts by and Mm -hmm. like that's like i still am hitting that after all these years of being in both of those and you're just like yeah there's got to be a way to have a common language that we can do and then you let the simplify you let these in that case, some log aggregators do what they're great at, right? Like they saw this particular niche thing on ML or metrics or whatever, cool. But yep. I'm trying to make sure that when the malware log ends up in my SIB, like it makes it to pager duty. Like, yeah. or I'm like, hey, I got this threat hunting correlation. I want to see if this behavior that strings together and that just stays consistent. So yeah, um, I think if anyone, any blue teamers out there getting started, they should just, just Google that and just take a look at um, the Sigma rules because you're right. When you realize that you could say, cool, I can take like the matter attack library, hit the export button to my vendor of or my log vendor of choice, and then just dump it and see what happens. I mean, that's probably the most crude way you could use this tool, but you know, it's a good place to start and see what jumps out at you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I just realized that all of us, well, except for me, I'm filthy PM, uh, is is in the detection business. Mr. Betcher has a tool for detecting things. Amanda's, of course, MSSP, and you're you know, director of security. No, no, so no, no. You're all SAS, about the detection. Man. SAS. Yeah, it's not. It's I'm, not oh, I'm sorry. Um, wait. So you're you're a SAS. What is a software service? Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Hey, you so, ship logs and magic happens. Just yes, do the little exactly. connectors, and it's like find all the bad things. We are done doing no MSSP attention. work, man. <laughs> not, understood. So pay no attention to what's going on behind the curtain. <laughs> We're just out here to make the magic just, happen and dis- saw the lady in hand. Despite what our old customers think. That's fine. Oh. Well, you know, you're innovating, so they can understand. Mr. Betcher, uh, you know, to get you in, you know, make sure we get you on the, the conversation here. So is detection for you, um, you deal a lot with detection with malware and such. Um, how does how does that trickle up to your, you know, other detection environments? Because you, you work with, you know, Windows specifically, or you, you work those those kinds of issues. Um, what are what are some of the pain that you have with detection mechanisms? Because like we were talking about with Sigma, um, unless they're universal or they're compatible, then you have to run them through some kind of filter or or something. What 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 are the heart you know heartburn you have with uh, detection mechanisms and and deciding on whether or not it's actually a uh, something that's actionable? Deciding on what's actionable is probably. Is, is one of the, well, at least we can get to that point, mm. right? To where we have a lot of data that we can start filtering things out. That's, that's a good place to be. A uh, lot of companies don't, don't even get there, right? Mm-hmm. So, so that's, like I said, that's a good place to be. Now, how do you, how do you decide to filter those out? Um, well, that's that's a must because a lot of times uh organizations will say okay let's just log everything and send it up right i try to tone that down at the endpoints to get uh, the only only the actionable things uh, or the things that are high value for example um command line logging right so log the command line you don't have to get process um process kill or, or any of that kind of stuff. Or uh, I made a connection to this thing and then the connection was severed at this point. You know, you may have uh, agents that once you detect something, you can open up the floodgates and then get all that extra data, right? So, so your SIM isn't overwhelmed with data or you can piecemeal it and say, well, these 10 endpoints might be affected. So let me open the floodgates for those 10, right? It's, it's, um, it's not a place you want to be where everyone is sending 
everything to your SIM and then you've got to filter through all that data. So, you know, take the thing that's giving you the most pain uh, or that's taking up the most room in your database and see if you can trim that down. Maybe you don't need any of it, right, to, to have some detection. It's, it's, a, it's a tough question to answer and it depends on the organization and how to customize it. I mean, that's pretty much the only answer I can give you. So you said you had a hard stop, Mr. Betcher? <clears throat> in 20 minutes. Oh, in 20 minutes, okay. Because um, so... I'd like to respond to that. I think that is <laughs> such a cool thing. I'm glad you say that. Please so, ahead, I mean, there are two things, like I couldn't agree with you more that it's about like, what are the use cases you're actually trying to solve for versus like collecting all of the things. And I definitely think that's a huge distinction between I'm going to deem a mature and immature organization, um, security operations center. And in, uh, one who says, I don't know, therefore collect everything because one day I might need it. And who knows if I drop that keyword in there, that right log will pop at two o'clock in the morning, I'll find my smoking gun. Okay. That has never worked. Like in my experience, like <clears throat> I'm sure others have had experience, other experiences, but like Thank that you. whole idea, collect all the things doesn't work. Now, to the audience out there, like the latest, if you're like in a Windows environment and you're trying to figure out process execution, like we we're just discussing, um, the latest versions of Sysmon, like literally, that's so cool. Like, like they thought about this too. And to your point, they allow us to say what we want to capture and don't capture. Can I take little rules, stick them together? If I see, I'm going to make this one up, it's like Windows, window, uh, sorry, Microsoft Word executing PowerShell that makes a network connection. You can take that rule set push it down. And only when that triggers, do I send all that data back up to my SIM. So this idea that like, they've kind of done us a favor by democratizing, if I may, a little bit of like the EDR space where we can take those that common library, we can write those rules, we don't have to collect all the logs. But to your point, it's just like, let's collect the use cases that we know we need, and the metadata around to support that argument, and then pull that back. Um, and then the other kind of thing to that is if you're not in that non environment yet, um, believe, and this is a few years old, but actually two years old, the, the Japanese CERT team, the Japanese CERT team, they have released um, a really good reference on what Windows event IDs to use to solve which use cases. So you don't need to turn on everything in Windows because that's the fastest way to blow up your Splunk license, but you can turn on these 10, 20 um, event window event IDs, and you can solve all these use cases with that data that comes out. So that's another great reference to start with, like as you were talking about, what are we trying to solve for? What do we need to you to bring up those use cases, and then let's go collect that information. And uh, I think Windows does a really good job of of um, logging on the endpoint, so you can turn all the things on on the endpoint that you need, like you said, uh, mm. the important things, but just not send them up to your sim right and then um you can categorize those particular event ids and say okay if i suspect lateral movement let me turn let me flip this lateral movement bit and start sending all of the um you know 26 24s right yeah. to to my sim and say okay there's there's my lateral movement among other things or if i suspect that there's a powershell exploit going around or somebody's using powershell manually let me send all the powershell logs to the sim so i flip that bit right on yeah. a certain number of endpoints so that's a good way of not sending everything but it's available there if you need it so that your agent that. can then take okay i think i got hit three days ago let me let me go back three days and just send all those logs and so your SIM is then flooded with three days of logs, but it's the right logs, the ones you need, the things that define lateral movement or PowerShell in those examples. You don't have to send everything, just those things that you need in that particular time window. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, and yeah, I think you're right. Like a little bit of a script or a little bit of automation right there. It's like, if you see this behavior, then turn on logging really aggressively in these areas and for further analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I think we're, I think we're, uh, the last little bit here um, I wanted to to talk about was dis, uh, you know detection fatigue, and I'm I'm sure Amanda has this issue, and and Connor sees it a lot. Um, is there uh, obviously there is such a thing, but I mean I'm thinking of the boy who cried wolf. Are there legitimate detection uh, 
things out there that maybe we shouldn't be logging or it, you know, is there a triage method method that we should employ to make sure that only like the top 15 are looked at instead of, Oh, well, we need to, you know, monitor, you know, 500 detection, you know, 500 is going to be, you know, lo- you know, either it's going to be false positive, it's going to be false negative, uh, or, you know, how, how are we, you know, when, when something real comes along that it actually is an indicator of compromise, yeah. you know, we won't know it. So, uh, how do we how do we tread that line between de- decision fatigue or detection fatigue and, and you know um, you know getting real actionable data and I think we'll start with Amanda and then we'll go Connor and then Mr. Betcher last. Um, gosh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff you shouldn't log. <laughs> um, gosh, I think maybe. <sighs> See here, stick to my top couple. Um, there, I know there's a lot of people that try and log uh, like Windows firewall information okay. that don't actually have it configured. Oh, so you can log that all you want. If you don't have it configured to do anything, it's not going to do a whole lot. Okay, um, it's not going to do anything, right? No. <laughs> are, are you? Are they doing it because of compliance issues or government? You know, Maybe. it's very easy to turn on logging everything. It is. Think about it. Yeah. It is. It really is. Um, But we'll, uh, what is it? 51, 56, 51, 58. 58. And is there 44 maybe? Whatever Windows filtering platform connections is that gives you zero to no information sometimes if it's not configured. It's it's Um, typically 51, 56 is the one you need mm -hmm. um, because that'll show you what process made the connection to what. Yep. Uh, Yep. That's highly valuable. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, was was that everything, Ms. Berlin? Uh, you know. Uh, what else? What, what else? What was the other question? So, what not to log, and then about uh, just fatigue in general. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't. It's one of when people come to us for a solution. Anyways, talking like legitimately from Blue Mira, um, that's one of the biggest concerns that a lot of people will have because, again, it's really easy to turn on all of the logging for everything and uh, configuring that for whitelisting can be really difficult. Um, so if you can go down the path of using Sigma rules and um, you know, trying to weed out stuff in the beginning, like at least if you're implementing your own SIM, it can be really really tiring uh to to try and get all that white noise to go away um that's i mean we try and do all that kind of stuff on the back end so i don't know that like we don't have alert fatigue now i mean kind of on the back end sometimes we do um and some people do have it just because of compliance that they i feel like they're doing incorrectly um we have some people that want to know every time an account is uh locked out whether it's a computer or a user um so i don't know just also depends on the on the person <laughs> yeah some people don't find it annoying and don't think it's uh overwhelming but there's no use that you can get out of a lot of that stuff even if you are getting it all the time that makes sense okay mm-hmm. all right connor uh, it's up to you what uh what what does this decision fatigue look like or detection oh, fatigue dude. look like for you so there's a reason I have these wrinkles <laughs> and I'm should a little, a little prematurely. Um, and I got a lot of gray hair. So thankfully you can't see on an audio only podcast. Um, so, so here's what I'd say. So I think the number one problem when it comes to decision, decision fatigue is this, that when people create detections, they often kind of, they should really think of in a structured framework. I'm very big on frameworks because it really helps us focus and get things right. Talk about, we just talked about a second ago, start with your use case and work your way backwards. So for instance, when you're creating a detection, are you trying to detect an adversary in the infrastructure inside the application? Or is it a business logic issue? Like, I think a lot of people are just like, hey, let's go create detections. And so you have this like, this thing happened inside our business app. Okay, that's bad. And then they jumped over to, um, we've now recognized that the malware has, sorry, that there's something wrong with, there's a suspicious event going on in the infrastructure. Our Windows environment just spawned PowerShell and it shouldn't have. Our Linux box just made a connection to somewhere and it shouldn't have, right? So separate all of those out and then measure their effectiveness accordingly, right? So look at what is your detection library for 
the tax in your infrastructure. If you're a company that is a SaaS company and you're putting code on the internet and this is how you make your, you realize your value as a company, great. What are the things that are happening inside the application? Do you have exploit attempts? Do you have people attempting to upload malicious scripts? Whatever the case may be. What does that look like? And look at that, but keep it distinct from your infrastructure. And then your third one is your business logic. You might have a very valid user who shows up into your, organ, into your, um, platform, into your software environment and they perform fraud. Like you're not gonna find that if you're looking at infrastructure and the application. So that's a business logic issue. So I would say separate all three of those and then build one alert at a time and make sure you've got metrics for the alert before you go live. This idea go back to the detection as code. If it goes live, how do you measure its effectiveness? How many false positives is it raising? How much time do you spend babysitting that detection and should you just nuke it and start over again? Right, so let's just start by saying, okay, let's put a framework of having those three that are distinctly separate. Um, and, and if we start with that and then we put the metrics in place, I think that's how we start to solve the fatigue issue. And then we have to always remember that if you're a SOC manager, if you're a security manager, that a human on your team is receiving this alert. And so you really just got to protect the human on the other side of this. And that might mean that you need to invest in a SOAR platform. It also might mean that you need better detections. It might mean that you need to outsource who's doing your detections because you just want them doing the analysis and the response to those detections. And then I'll leave you this last, this last other piece here. Separate out what is the difference between a signal that you're going to respond to and an alert, an enrichment that's gonna give you context and then a dashboard that you might use during an investigation. So those three things should be separate and you shouldn't try and trigger notifications to your Slack and your page duty for all of them, right? They're very specific use cases. So now flip that on said what I just said, I just gave you a three by three matrix, right? Are you in the business? Are you in the infrastructure and in the application or the business layer logic? And then are you creating a signal and an enrichment or a dashboard? What are your metrics for that nine by nine grid? I think that is a framework in which I would try to start to solve the um, decision fatigue alert alert fatigue. Yeah, because if something's just a risk, yeah. you don't want to know about that in the middle of the night. No, come back to tomorrow morning. You're not gonna, if you can't remediate it two o'clock in the morning, why alert it two o'clock in mm -hmm. the morning? Yep. Very cool. All right, Mr. Betcher, anything uh, to add there? Uh, anything you'd wow, like to? I don't know if I can top that. Uh, I'd, I'd just like to add to it a little bit um, on some of the new stuff that's coming out. So let's say you've got your framework and your, um, your you're doing good, you're mature, right? And something new pops up, like somebody publishes a malware report and it says, well, we found this new adversary and they use this particular technique. Make sure that your um, detections allow you to detect that technique. Now, this is probably going to be um, a severity one if it happens, right? And, and you need to practice that particular tr trigger. For example, um, uh, as Connor, I think you mentioned a word, what did you say? A word doc um, executes VB script or PowerShell you mentioned, and then um, makes a connection to the internet. Th those types of things like that, when you see that in a malware report, you should be able to detect that series of events, right? And alert on it and be able to respond to it. Yeah, I, I love that behavior versus event. If you see a behavior, that's a much stronger signal than if you just find a discrete event, PowerShell is executed. Okay, well actually, what was the whole chain and with PowerShell in the middle? Right. You have very different context yeah, to your point. Right. So dur during our discussion here, Connor asked Amanda thoughts on MITRE SHIELD. What oh, is a MITRE that. SHIELD? You guys don't know about this. It is the coolest thing since the MITRE ATT&CK framework. I am so excited about the MITRE SHIELD. Well, shoot, tell us a little bit about that before we leave and maybe we can make, have you come back in a you know couple of months or so and, and do another show all about that. Um, for in the same way that MITRE ATT&CK gave us as the industry a framework of reference that allowed us to have an organizing principle an organizing conversation about who are the, like what are the adversaries doing? Give us a, a kill chain, the one walkthrough and a sense of like, where we are, right? So it gave us a map and a framework and people can start building against that. Now, what MITRE has done is flipped on its head and said, okay, what if you're a blue teamer and you're trying to have visibility and observability in order to detect that? So they're looking at 
what are your points of observability? What are your um, containment and response um, actions that you could perform in that? And then you measuring your maturity against it. Like every framework, there are always edge cases that fall off and it's not meant to capture everything. But I felt, again, here is something where the MITRE attack has understood the security community. And so the, the, excuse me, the MITRE um, teams have understood the security community. They gave us MITRE, which was on the red team side. Uh, so, oh, goodness. They gave us the attack framework, which was on the uh, red, side, red team side. And now they're given a shield, which is on the blue team side. And this is the ability to say, do we have the right... Um, visibility, the right observability, and the right con um, containment and response actions across the kill chain so that when somebody arrived, we we're ready and poised and good to go for that response. Um, and if I remember correctly, the URL is shield.miter. Right? Yeah, so I say what, what, like what, what annoys me is the fact that I was going through and doing something like this, and I had actually registered the domain. Um, oh, Gosh, what's uh, what's the um, oh exploit DB? So I, I had registered defense-db.com, and I was uh -huh. gonna make like an exploit DB, but for blue team stuff that mapped to MITRE, and then maybe a week after I registered the domain name, they came out with that. Oh dang! <laughs> I'm like, all right, you guys probably you did win. it better because you have an entire team working on it. Um, exactly. But I guess I guess I just yep. didn't go at it fast enough. Uh, well. <laughs> You know, it's maybe, a genius idea, though. You wouldn't be the first person to fork something that you know maybe didn't work for you, or you wanted to add something. You wouldn't be. No, the it's first fine. I don't have enough time for that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just let exactly. them do it, and I'll use it. It's like we all recognize the problem. We're just like, if I can have thirty-six hours in a day, I might be able to contribute to the yes. solution. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's right. Yep. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well. Um, I don't know. Last, last thoughts. I know Mr. Betcher's got a hard stop here in a few minutes. Uh, Connor, we'll go ahead with you and then uh, we'll, we'll go with Mr. Betcher and Ms. Berlin uh, to finish it up. Any, any final thoughts? I have just so enjoyed this conversation. Thank you all. Like it is so nice to be able to come nice, high executive conversation right down to the weeds. And we're talking <laughs> about event ideas and then we're back up again, talking about framework. So um, it's a really amazing and unique thing you guys have here. And I love the fact you have the show. And again, just thank you so much for having me on today. Appreciate it. All right. And of course, we can find you on the Confident Defense podcast, uh, confidentdefense.com slash podcast. Um, and uh, go check that out if uh, you want to want to want to have yet another podcast to listen to. So I've got, yes. you know, a bunch more oh, yeah. for my walks on, on a regular basis. Cool. Miss um, Berlin, any last thoughts? Um, nope. <laughs> you can you okay, can you good. can find me at uh info sister on twitter i-n-f-o-s-y-s-t-i-r right on all right mr betcher uh, defense is is very difficult it's a very challenging uh but it's also fun if you get in the right environment and you build these things i mean i like building things right from scratch hopefully but i could also tear things down and build some new things right um it's very challenging, but that's why um, that's what draws it to draws me to it, right? So yeah, if you right if you like a challenge, this is this is where it's at. Yep, it it's uh, interesting. We're starting to see more blue team tools because people, I think, are starting to acknowledge the fact that blue. It's team nothing is like hard, those easy so. easy red team jobs that are out there. Yeah, you know, run run some of <laughs> They just got to get it once, whatever. right? They just got to get, oh, 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 we're done. Here's <laughs> right. your report. We win. And you're like, well, wait, but you didn't right. do all the other stuff that I was offending against. You know, it's like, yeah, so it's hard. What's your email so all the red team hate can go to you, Connor? <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if, if people wanted to reach out to you, Connor, how would they? Uh, how would Thank they you. Do so? The best way to do this would be on LinkedIn. Um, so we'll drop in the show notes, but it's Connor D as in David Sherman. Um, so Connor D Sherman on LinkedIn. You guys can find me there. Um, obviously, as you mentioned, this is gonna be the podcast, which is on YouTube and Spotify. Um, there's two: the strategic one that we have on a weekly basis, and then there's the tactical one we have with insights with my co-host James Chiapetta, um, who is an AppSec Wunderkind. It's just blows my mind. I learned so much every time. And that's why he's on the podcast. So I would say start there. Um, love to connect with you on LinkedIn. Love to continue the conversation. Um, and if you, and the podcast as well is where I'm, we're putting a lot of my time and energy at the moment. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, we're going to get out of here real quick. Uh, follow the 
BreakSec Podcast at BreakSec on Twitter, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. You can follow me on Twitter at Brian Break, B-R-Y-A-N, B-R-A-K-E. Uh, appreciate all of our fans for spreading the word about the podcast, likes, um, you know, stars, reviews, whatever. Uh, we're on every major podcast platform, including now we're on the, the Amazon uh, podcast uh, or Audible or whatever the hell they're calling it. There's a link in the show notes to that. Uh, you can go to BreakingSecurity.com and uh, check all that out. That's B-R-A-K-E-I-N-G Security.com. <clears throat> uh, thank you to our patrons for their continued generosity and support. Uh, the podcast is always free, but we appreciate those folks that uh, want to help us out with, uh, you know, ancillary support being, you know, Zoom, uh, you know, domain hosting, etc. cetera. Uh, and uh, we're, we're really uh, thankful for that uh, extra support there. Um, we have a T-Pub store. Again, you can find that on the, on the, the breakingsecurity.com in our show notes. Uh, you can buy T-shirt. You can still get Miss Berlin's face on a T-shirt. Uh, she's uh, she's laughing as I say that because it never gets old. It's still fun to see that, even <laughs> if we're not in meat space yet. Uh, you know, go get the gift that keeps on giving, and that would be Miss Berlin's face on a T-shirt. So, yep. Uh, cool. So, um, if um, I guess that's it for breaking down security this week. Uh, take care of yourself. Be kind to one another. It's, getting harder and harder as we head towards the end of the year. Uh, take care of yourself because you're the only you you have. And we'll talk to you again soon. Bye.
and we're done. Cool. I voted oh, this morning. Man. Oh, uh, we're getting ours in the mail in the next couple of days. So, um, cool. Yeah. Um, we do have another podcast. I think we can just specifically talk about IR playbooks. Uh, so that's cool. We kind of, you know, I, I realized about, I don't know, 20 minutes in, we're like, yeah, we're going to go beyond playbooks at this point, more of an organizational kind of thing, which is great because it leaves us more options for, for shows. Um, yeah, Connor, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I like I like talking at, at, at a high level with this. Uh, I was actually looking at Easy Cater to see if there were jobs available online. Um, not for me specifically. Uh-huh. <laughs> Shut your mm-hmm. mouth. Well, you let me know where you have a when Bob needs a job. You you do talk to me about Bob. Yes, okay. yes, Bob. Okay. Bob is a security PM and he's looking to do more security PM and process improvement across the board or in an organizational level. So Bob is uh, in a weird space. Uh, he wants to continue doing security, but you know, there's a lot of room for process improvement in the security space. So just nobody's you're gonna, hiding. I totally get it. You're going to love this conversation I've got coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, he's a very senior PM product manager um, and he's talking about bringing agile processes to a security organization. How do you make okay. your security org agile and in working inside the environment? So nice. Uh, okay. Shameless plug. Just, yeah. Right on. No, I, <laughs> but, I, yeah, I did the, uh, the, I did some training recently for um, uh, organizational change management. So from ProSci and uh, I'm seeing a lot of parallels there and a lot of things for maturing organizations as a whole. So I definitely will, uh, will, will grab that and listen to it. Uh, I don't know how much product uh, experience, but yeah, it's like if you're not, you know, a product manager for security, then you've pretty much pigeonholed yourself. So I'm trying to branch out a little bit, but uh, yeah, Connor, appreciate you coming on. Uh, Mr. Betcher, I know you've got to go. So um, thank you all for, you know, taking did, the time. Go ahead. Did, did want to say one thing for Amanda. Um, mm-hmm. Amanda, if, since you have this incredibly awesome book that you published a while back, um, I don't would you that. like to come onto the Confident Defense podcast and talk about you and your book? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I could probably get Lee to come on too, if you want. That would my be co-author. Great. 